So glad that you're here, that you're worshiping with us. Hey, welcome to everybody who's joining us later online. We're glad that you're here and that you're a part as well. And today we're actually, I think a second ago I said we're going to be continuing on in this series, which is partially true. We're also going to be wrapping up this series that we're, we've been in for the past four weeks. So today is week five that we've been calling Trapped. And in this series, we've just been talking about how it is that we can get free from sin and temptation in our lives and the things that trap us. And so maybe you haven't been here for every week of the series. Maybe today is your first time with us or you're tuning in for the first time. So I'm going to just catch you up to where we are in this series and kind of what we've said so far because we've just kind of been building each and every week in this series. And so this is what we said in week one of the series that sin traps us, but Jesus sets us free. Amen. Somebody. This is what we believe as a church. And so we talked about how it is that we could break the cycle of sin in our lives. That was week one. Week two, we said this, that what you're trying to hide, God is seeking to heal. We talked about the power of prayer and the power of confession. And then week three of the series, we said that we can run away because Jesus made a way. And we talked about what it looked like for me and you to flee sexual sin and sexual temptation in our lives. And so if that's something that you struggle with, I would highly encourage you to check that message out. And then last week we said this, that Jesus can turn your trap into a testimony. And we talked about what it looked like to flip the script, so to speak, on the way that we view weakness. And that we could actually, God could use our weakness as part of our testimony to help somebody else get free. And so if you missed any of those weeks, if that sounds intriguing to you, or if you just ever like, hey, that was good and I want to share that with a family member, I think somebody could use that. You can always catch up or share the messages from keyschurch.com slash watch. Or if you're a podcast person, just search for the Keys Church audio podcast. But today I want to wrap up this series by teaching you a message that I'm calling Choose Your Chains. And as always, I do want to encourage you to take notes this morning. Like I said a minute ago on the back of that worship guide, take pictures on your phone, take notes on your phone, but let's not just be hearers of God's word. Let's be doers of God's word. Amen, somebody? And like I said, in this series, we've been talking about how it is that we can get free from sin, how it is that we can break free from the things that trap us and tempt us in our lives. And I think that in the past four weeks, We've done a pretty good job of looking at Scripture and getting application from Scripture as to what that actually looks like for us in our lives practically. And some steps that we could actually take so that we could get free. So here's what I want to talk about this morning. The getting free is one thing, but staying free is another. So far, we've talked about how to get free. But once you get free, then you actually have to stay free. And that's a completely different thing. Because so often the things that trap us, the sin, the temptations that are in our lives, we can get freedom from those things. And if we're not careful, we'll fall right back into them. And if we're not careful, the very same thing that used to trap us is now trapping us again. The very same thing that we used to deal with, we're still dealing with. And well, I got freedom, but then I wasn't able to stay free. And I actually ended up getting trapped again. And that's why there's this saying, maybe you've heard this saying before, old habits die hard. Right? Anybody familiar with this saying? It's just this idea that the habits that you have, that you've done for a long time, that perhaps seem like they've become part of who you are, well, they're difficult to get rid of. They're difficult to kill. And it's even difficult to stay rid of those habits. And it's why you'll see somebody lose a bunch of weight and it's like, man, that's so awesome. But then they gain it all back because that bad eating habit comes back. Or you'll see somebody abuse tobacco and then they finally get freedom from it and they stop smoking cigarettes or they stop using tobacco. But then it's like, I'm stressed out and so I'm just going to have one cigarette and like next thing you know, here they are abusing tobacco again. The same thing happens with alcohol or pornography or any addiction or things that we deal with in our lives. Because, well, old habits, they die hard. And they're hard to to get rid of. And it's one thing to get free, but then it's another thing to actually stay free. And so here's the thing that I believe each and every one of us have to do. Is that we have to understand that once we get free, we have to choose to stay free. And I very intentionally chose the word choose because it is a choice that you have to make. And if we're not intentional about this, 
And if it's not a daily decision that I'm going to continue to fight, that I'm going to continue to ne take next steps to be free, we will end up trapped again. Because scripture tells us that we have an enemy, the devil, who prowls around like a lion waiting for someone to devour. We're the someone. And his tricks are not new. And the same thing that he used to trap you with is going to be the same thing that he attempts to trap you with again and again and again. He's just going to come at it from a different angle. And so, once we're actually free and we've experienced freedom, and maybe that's some of you in this series, and you feel like you've taken some next steps, and it's like, man, I've gotten some practical application. I feel like I'm getting freedom. We have to understand that now we have to choose to stay free. And that's what I want to talk about from Scripture today. Because I believe that Scripture actually tells us how we can choose to stay free. And so this morning, we're going to be in the New Testament, so the last two-thirds or so of your Bible, and we're going to be in the book of Romans. And it's actually a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And fun fact, the past few weeks, we've been in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, which are also letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. And Paul actually wrote his letter to the Romans from Corinth. So when he was with the Corinthians, he writes the letter to the church in Rome. And he writes it in anticipation of visiting them on his way to Spain. Because he wanted to go to Spain and plant churches there and spread the gospel there. And even though Paul was really directly responsible for the church in Rome, he actually had never been to the church in Rome. Like he kind of planted it, but he planted it from afar. People who were a part of his ministry went and planted the church in Rome. And so we read First and Second Corinthians and it's like Paul getting on to people, right? It's Paul correcting people for not doing the right things. But that's really not what Romans is. Romans is a letter of correction. He's just writing them in anticipation of visiting them. And even though the Romans had a good, solid church with solid theology and solid doctrine around what they believed, Paul ends up pinning this letter that is really the groundwork for Christian theology and doctrine and why it is that we believe what we believe as Christians. And some scholars say that Romans is the most important book in the entire Bible. I would definitely say along with the four Gospels, you have then Romans. And that's kind of the groundwork for everything that we believe as Christians. And where we're going to be today is in Romans chapter 6. And Paul is actually talking about sanctification, which I know is like a $2 word, right? It's like, man, it's a big word, sanctification. Which is really just the continuation or the process of us continuing to look like Jesus. Continuing to take steps to become who it is that God's created us to be. And while he's talking about sanctification in chapter 6, he talks about how we're set free from sin. And as he talks about the freedom that we have from sin, I believe he actually reveals to us how it is that you and I can choose to continue to live in that freedom every single day. And so this morning we're going to jump in Romans chapter 6. We're going to start off in verse 15. And this is what it says. Paul says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? This feels like a rhetorical question, right? And what you need to know is that actually in chapter 6, verse 1, he ends up saying, hey, should we continue sinning so that we can receive more of God's grace? Because, well, this was the thought process of some people. That when we sin, we receive God's grace. Therefore, if I just continue to sin, then I receive more of God's grace. And so somehow, in this weird, twisted way, my sin is glorifying God. Because he's getting to exercise more of his grace. And Paul's like, of course not. <laughs> like he answers that question when he asks it in verse 1. He's like, no. Like that's not what we do. And he actually explains that we're not under the law anymore, but we're under grace. Like how Paul sets this up. And so once he explains that we're not under the law, but we're under grace and we're not supposed to be sinning, like he asks the question again, but he phrases it a little different. He doesn't say, should we continue sinning? He just says, shall we sin? And the idea here isn't that we would continue to live in a lifestyle of sin, but rather, can I just dabble in a little bit of sin here and there when I'm on vacation, when I need to decompress? You know, when it's been a hard week. When it was a hard day, like, I'm not trapped by this thing anymore. Like, it's not an issue for me anymore. So, like, it can be a one-off thing. Like, is that okay? Because, you know, we're, like, not under the law. But we're under grace. And so I have grace to cover this. So can I sin? Paul says, by no means. And I love this because in the Greek, this phrase can be translated to heaven forbid. He's like, of course not. Like, this is not who we are. This is not how we are to act as Christians, as believers, as Jesus people. We have not been freed to sin. If you've been around Key Church, where you've probably heard us say this, you've been freed from sin. 
Not to something, but from something that we don't have to be the people who we don't want to be anymore. That we don't have to struggle with the things that we struggle with anymore. That Jesus didn't die just so we can have heaven one day, but he died so that we could have abundant life today. And we're not freed to live a sinful lifestyle. We're freed from having to live in sin. This is what Paul is saying. He continues and he says, Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one that you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. And we can read this and be like, so offer yourself as obedient slaves. Like, who's offering themselves as a slave? Like, that's not how slavery works, right? Well, not in our culture. Not in the way that we view slavery. But what we have to understand is slavery was much, much different in this culture. And actually, the majority of people who would be reading these letters would either be slave owners or they would be slaves themselves. And oftentimes people would offer themselves up as slaves because, well, it ensured that you had a roof over your head. It ensured that you have food. And because of the terrible injustice that was slavery here in the United States, that's kind of the lens that we see slavery through. Right? That horrible, horrible injustice. But that's not really how it was always, especially in, in the Bible but and then in this time in this day and age now don't get me wrong there were people who abused slaves and there were bad slave owners but that was more the exception and not the rule and so when Paul says when you offer yourself as obedient slaves they're not thinking like why are you talking about slaves there's like this is culturally relevant to them they're like oh okay yeah when you offer yourself up as an obedient slave you're saying I will serve you in return for having a roof over my head and food in my stomach and he just reminds them that you're slaves to the one that you obey Like you can't be a slave to this guy and then like only serve his neighbor. That makes you a slave to his neighbor. Like you're not actually, like you're only a slave to the one that you obey. And so if you're a slave to sin, well here's what you need to know. That leads to death. Not just physical death, although physical death, especially depending on what type of sin it is that you're dealing with. But most certainly spiritual death. That it leads to separation from our Heavenly Father. He says, or you're going to be a slave to obedience, which leads to righteousness or to right standing with God. So you have sin that separates us from God. You have obedience, which leads to righteousness. He says, but thanks be to God. Praise God. That though you used to be slaves to sin, you used to be. This, let me remind you, this is not who you are anymore, Christian follower of Jesus if you call yourself a follower of Jesus if you call yourself a Christian you're no longer slaves to sin you've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance he said you you used to be this slave to sin but now you actually obey Jesus's teachings now you obey the commands of Jesus and the commands of God and now this is what's claimed your allegiance And here's what you and I need to know that we have to understand if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, that we have to obey Jesus in order to follow Jesus. You have to. This is not like a if you want to. Like, no, this is like it kind of comes with the territory. Because if you're not obeying Jesus, then you're not following Jesus. You can't say, well, I'm a follower of Christ and then not follow Christ. Like, that doesn't make you a follower. That just makes you somebody who says they're a follower. But like, your life doesn't actually look that way. No, we have to obey Jesus. We have to obey his commands. And so often in our culture, there are people who want the benefits of following Jesus without actually following Jesus. They want the benefits of a godly life and they want the blessing, but they don't want to follow Jesus. And just a reminder that if you are a Christian, if you call yourself a Christ follower, obedience is not an option. Obedience is a requirement or else you're not. We have to obey in order to follow Jesus. He continues on and he says, you have been set free from sin. Amen. That's what he's saying. You've been set free from sin. He just says it plainly. And you've become slaves to righteousness. It's like, And what? Like, I thought I was free. Like, you've been set free from sin, but now I'm, but like I'm still a slave? It's like, yeah, 
And now you're a slave to righteousness. And what is Paul saying here? He's saying this, that we've not been set free to do what we want. We've been set free to become who God wants us to be. This is why we've been set free. You have not been set free to now live however you want. To now go dabble in that sin whenever you feel like it and need to. Because like I got freedom from it. So now I can kind of do it when I want to. Because the consequences aren't going to be as bad. And I can live how I want and do what I want. It's like no this is not why you've been set free. You've actually been set free to become who God wants you to be. And can I tell you that what God has for you and me is so much better than what we have or want for ourselves. Because no eye has seen, no ear has heard what the Lord has for those who love him, who trust in him, who are called according to his purpose. He has immeasurably more for me and you. This is all things that scripture tells us, right? We've been set free to become who God wants us to be. Paul continues on and he says, I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. He's almost like apologizing a little bit. For like using slavery, but he's like really not like a better metaphor here for me to use. And I'm just using this example of slavery that's a part of your everyday life. Because in your human limitations, we don't fully understand what our relationship with God actually looks like. We don't fully understand how it's supposed to function. And so I'm just, I'm using the example of slavery. And so just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity... And to ever increasing wickedness. This is who you were. You were slaves to, to sin. And to wickedness. And to impurities of all kind. He says so now. Let there be a shift. Let me remind you. That as Jesus followers. You're supposed to repent. Turn the other way. Turn back to God. Now offer yourselves as slaves. To righteousness. Leading to holiness. So we're still slaves. But now we're slaves to righteousness. And what does righteousness lead to? Well, righteousness leads to holiness. What's holiness? Looking more like Jesus. Becoming more like Jesus. Taking steps to becoming who it is that God's created us to be. Who he wants us to be. Who he desires us to be. Paul says, when you are slaves to sin, you are free from the control of righteousness. Like you were free, but like not in a good way. Because you were serving sin. You were slaves to sin. Therefore, you did not have the ability to be righteous. In other words, you did not have the ability to be in a right relationship with your heavenly father. It was actually impossible. Because you were a slave to sin. He said, and what benefit did you reap from the time, from the things that you're now ashamed of? What was the benefit of the sin in your life? And he reminds them, oh, it was, it was shame. <laughs> what did you reap from all that, that sin and living for yourself? It was shame. Those things result in death. Again, spiritual death. Separation from God. And isn't this what we always reap from sin? That sin is good in the moment or else we wouldn't do it most of the time, right? But it ultimately leads to shame. It leads... To guilt, And we said this earlier in this series, but it bears repeating. You need to know this. If you're dealing with shame this morning, that shame is from the devil. Shame is not from God. Shame is from the enemy because he wants you to be shameful and he wants you to hide what you're struggling with. And he wants that shame to cause you to spiral out of control and to stay dead in your sin. Conviction comes from the Lord. It is God's loving kindness that leads us to repentance. And so the Lord will convict us. And he will call us to repent, which again just means to turn the other way. To turn from our sin, to turn towards God. He says, what did you benefit? What did you gain? Shame. Things that lead to death. He says, but now that you've been set free from sin, he just reminds them again, like I'm just going to continue to say it so that you remember, so that you're encouraged, so you would know that this is who you are, that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God been set free from sin but now you're slaves to God again an imperfect metaphor but just using this so you can wrap your mind around it he says the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life so what do we reap from being slaves of God what do we reap from righteousness we reap holiness we reap abundant life we reap 
Things like joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, love. Things that nobody's like, I don't want any of that. Like, keep that to yourself. We're all like, yes, please, some of that. Thank you. This is the benefit. Oh, yeah, and the results, the end game, where the road ends is actually eternal life because newsflash, this life isn't all there is. That there's life after this life. That there is eternal life and we're either going to spend eternity with God or separated from God. And the choice is ours. But the benefit of being a slave to God, well, that's eternal life. And then Paul says a verse that if you've ever been in church, you're probably familiar with. This is a very famous passage, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What we earn from our sin and our sinful nature and being slaves to sin, well, it's death. But the gift of God, the unmerited, undeserved, very much so free, we had to do nothing for it. This is what a gift is. Gift of God, unconditional, is eternal life. And notice he says, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because can I remind you this morning, that there's only one way into a right relationship with your heavenly father. Jesus says this himself, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the father except through him. Do not let the world deceive you that many roads will lead to heaven. Many roads will lead you to freedom. Many roads will lead you to get to where you want to be. That is a lie from the devil. There is only one way to a right relationship with God, and it's Jesus. There's only one way to eternal life, and it's Jesus. This is how Paul ends this chapter. This is how he ends this thought. And I read one commentator this week who said he ends it here and it's almost like a challenge that he leaves them with. This challenge of which are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to be a slave to sin, which leads to death? Or are you going to be a slave to God, which leads to eternal life? Which is it? And here's what we need to know and what we have to understand. That we're either slaves to sin or we're slaves to righteousness. There is no in-between. We're slaves either way. Again, maybe not the perfect metaphor, right? Paul seemingly admits that. But either way, we're in chains. Either way, we're slaves. So are we going to be slaves to sin, which ultimately leads to death? It leads to shame. It leads to brokenness. Or are we going to be slaves to righteousness, which leads to holiness, which leads to eternal lives? And this is why I would challenge each and every one of us this morning, choose your chains. You have to choose. And we have to choose daily what our chains are going to be. We have to choose daily what it is that we're going to be a slave to. And let me remind us that this is the things that we're choosing between. We're either going to be slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. You're going to be one or the other. There isn't an in-between. You may think there is, but there isn't. And guess what your default is? And my default is. And the default of every human who ever has walked this earth with the exception of Jesus himself is. Our default is to be a slave to sin. Our default is selfishness. Any, any parents in the room with kids? Did you have to teach your toddler to say mine? Did you have to teach them to hit other kids? Did you have to teach your kid to lie? No. Well, why? Because this is our default. And so are we going to be slaves to sin or are we going to be slaves to righteousness? We have to choose our chains. And let me remind us, this is the results of being slaves to sin. It's bondage, shame, and death. This is what Paul tells us in Romans 6. That when we're slaves to sin, we're actually not free. That we're trapped. That we're in bondage. And it leads to shame. This is what we reap. This is the fruit of our sin. It is shame. And ultimately it leads to death. Spiritual death. It leads to separation from God. So are we going to choose this? Or are we going to choose righteousness? Which leads to freedom, holiness, and eternal life. And this is, this is why it's an imperfect metaphor, right? It's because it's like, 
I'm a slave to righteousness, but I'm free. It's like, well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, but it's true. Well, I'm a slave. you saying I'm a slave to God and that somehow makes me free. It's like, yeah. Again, imperfect metaphor. Just using these worldly terms because we can't wrap our mind around what our relationship with God actually is and what it actually looks like. But making yourself a slave to God, making yourself a slave to righteousness, it's actually the only way that you can truly get free and stay free. It's how we experience freedom. And it leads, in, leads to holiness. That we would take those steps. That we would have abundant life. That we would begin to look more like Jesus. And ultimately it ends in eternal life. That at the end of this life. The lights don't just go out and game over. Like no. That we have eternal life. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so. We have to choose. To choose our chains. Are you going to be slaves to sin? Or are you going to be slaves to to righteousness. And let me tell you this morning that if you don't choose your chains, your chains will choose you. If you don't choose what it is that you're going to be chained to, the chains will choose you. And again, the default will be sin. And the default will be selfishness. And the default will be pride. And the default will be anger. And the default will be lust. And the default will be fill in the blank here. With whatever the thing is that you struggle with that always rears its head back up. If you don't choose your chains, your chains, they will choose you. So the choice is ours. So what do we do? Well, I would argue that we need to choose righteousness. And I have three steps for what I believe choosing righteousness looks like for me and you. And none of this is like groundbreaking stuff. This is just from scripture. This is very simple, very applicable to our lives, right? But this is how we choose righteousness. And this is how we choose every day to continue to be free. First step, die to yourself. (laughs) This is what Jesus says. That we have to pick up our cross daily and follow him. In other words, we have to die to ourselves and our will and our way and our sinful nature. And we have to die to greed and we have to die to lust and we have to die to gluttony and we have to die to selfishness and we have to die to anger. We have to die to ourselves. This is step number one. And why is it step number one? Because you can't have step number one Well, you can't have step number two without step number one. It starts with step number one, but ultimately you're trying to get to step number two, which is this, step into new life. That yes, we have to die to ourselves so that you can experience new life. So that you can step into all that God has for you. That's it. We we die to ourselves and then we step into new life. And some of you may be wondering, it's like, okay, How do I begin to step into new life? Number one, I would say it's pretty important to be a part of a local church. (laughs) And not because there's something magical about church. It doesn't have to be this church. It could be a home church. It could be that you're just a part of a small group. It could be a different church. But be a part of a local church. Why? Because you need to be surrounded with like-minded Christians who you can do life with who's going to keep you accountable. Who's going to love you. Who's going to lock arms with you. Who's going to... Help you become who it is that God's created you to be. We step into new life by doing things like actually opening up our Bible, the Word of God, and reading it. And we've talked about this before that, hey, for some of you, where you need to start is just reading the verse of the day because, like, you've never really read the Bible in your life, and that's great. Download the YouVersion Bible app, read the verse of the day. But for some of you, it's time to take that next step in stepping in new life. It's like, and I need to sit down for 15, 20 minutes a day. I need to actually be reading the word of God. I need to actually be reflecting on it. And I need to actually be asking myself, how does this apply to my life? How can I use this to take steps to become who it is that God wants me to be and who God's created me to be? And then you need to spend time in prayer. Not because prayer is going to be the thing that frees you, but because prayer is what gets you in the presence of the one who can get you free. Put you in the presence of your heavenly father and it will change change your whole perspective. And personally, I believe if, if you start your day with scripture, if you start your day in prayer, it will change your whole day. But then be a part of a local church. Make Sundays a priority for you and your family. 
Make being a part of a small group a priority for you and your family. We have groups here at Keys Church that you can come and be a part of men's groups, women's groups, other groups. And I think you could talk to anybody who's in our men's groups and our women's groups and they would tell you, no, this matters. And this is where we're doing the hard work of figuring out how we die to ourselves and then how we step into new life practically every single day. This is step one. This is step two. Step three, repeat. Preachers like having three points. So like I couldn't just leave it there, right? So like, but it's just step one and step two. Again. So tomorrow morning, die to yourself and step into new life. And Tuesday morning, die to yourself and step into new life. And Wednesday morning, die to yourself and step into new life. Because what we think is, well, I died to myself yesterday. Well, guess what? Like, you're like Jesus. You're resurrected overnight. Like, you literally, you don't stay dead. You have to choose every day to die to yourself. You have to choose every day, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to step into the new life that he's offered me. And then we repeat. And this is how we choose righteousness. This is how we choose to follow Jesus. This is how we make the choice that Paul's asking us to make when he says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice that the wages of sin is death. I said this earlier, that means what we've earned is death. But what God's giving us what his gift is, is eternal life. Here's the good news of the gospel. God doesn't give us what we earned. He gives us what he paid for. He paid the price. He sent Jesus to live the life we couldn't, to die the death that we deserve on the cross, to raise to life on the third day, to defeat sin, death, and the grave so that we could be in right relationship with our heavenly father. Each and every one of us are deserving of death because that's what we've earned through our sin. We couldn't earn a right relationship with God. We couldn't get to God no matter how hard we tried. So God sent Jesus. And he doesn't give us what we've earned. Instead, he gives us what he paid for. And as we wrap up this series, I just want to end with this. And this isn't, this isn't profound. This isn't some nice play on words. This isn't, you know, probably going to be transformational for you. But I just want you to know this truth. I pray that you would tuck this truth away in your heart. That you would know this every day of your life when you wake up. That because of Jesus, you can be free and stay free. This is true. And it's not just true for the person to your left and the person to your right. It's true for you. That you can be free. And you can stay free. And you can step into new life because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. That if Jesus can forgive you, then he can free you. And he's forgiven you. And if he's forgiven much, then he can free you from the things that he had to forgive you for. Like this is the good news of the gospel that you've been set free from sin. And maybe you're here in this room this morning. Maybe you're watching online and you've never experienced that forgiveness. You've never experienced that freedom because you've never stepped into a relationship with Jesus. Or maybe you stepped away. But today is the day that you want to step into a relationship with Jesus for the first time or maybe return. For the first time in a long time, I want to give you the opportunity to do that this morning. Will you pray with me? Father God, you are good. Lord, and we are so thankful to be here this morning and to be in your presence. Lord, I pray right now if there's anybody within the sound of my voice. God, who says that that's me and I want to experience freedom. And I want to experience forgiveness and I want to experience abundant life today and I want eternal life one day and I want to choose my chains. I want to choose to be a slave to God, a slave to righteousness and accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. If anybody wants to do that today, I want to give them the opportunity to do so. Right where you are, you can just pray this prayer. You just repeat after me, but no, it's not a prayer that saves you. It's the finished work of Jesus on the cross that saves you. But if you're ready to make that decision today, you can pray to God and say this, Father God, I admit that I'm a sinner and I accept your free gift of salvation. I believe Jesus lived a life I couldn't, that he died a death that I deserve on the cross, but he rose to life on the third day.
I believe he defeated sin, death, and the grave. And because of him, one day I'll get to be in heaven with you. God, help me to follow you to the best of my ability for the remainder of my life. In Jesus' name. God, for the rest of us. Lord, I, I pray that we would choose our chains and that we would choose righteousness. That we would choose to be slaves to righteousness. That we would choose to be slaves to you, Lord. That we would be obedient to you, God, knowing that that leads to holiness. Knowing that that leads to eternal life one day, but it also leads to abundant life today. And so God, help us not only to get free for those of us who still need freedom, but for those of us who are experiencing freedom, help us stay free. That every single day we would wake up and we would die to ourselves and we would step into the new life that you've given us through Jesus. God, I thank you that we had the opportunity to gather today and worship together. I just pray that you would be with everybody within the sound of my voice. God, that you would go before them and behind them, that you would give them favor with you, everyone they see and talk to this week, and that you would bring us back safely next week to worship you together. God, we love you, we praise you, and we pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.